All right, everybody, welcome back to uh, CS162. Um, as you, those of you that are local have noticed today, it's like uh, we're on Mars or something because the sun is red and the smoke is in the sky. It's pretty strange, but let's see if we can uh, get a good lecture out of here anyway. So today we're going to continue our very short little discussion of um, talking about some abstractions at user level, both to help you get going in the class and to kind of see what it is that we're going to be doing um, in the kernel when we are trying to support these abstractions. So today we're going to talk about the file abstraction, which is really also the I.O. abstraction, uh, which is an interesting thing about, about Unix. Um, and uh, we're going to finish discussing process uh, management, which we didn't quite get finished with last time. But we'll talk about both the high and the low level file I.O. Uh, APIs. And we'll talk a bit about why we have the different ones. And, and then we'll uh, look at some interesting gotchas uh, that sort of come about when you mix processes and file descriptors in I.O. Um, uh, and yes, uh, to the comment in the chat, we are definitely in the upside down today. So, um, if you remember from last time, uh, among other things, we talked about threads and processes, and we introduced just briefly this notion of synchronization. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about that in a couple of lectures, uh, but just remember some ideas here. One was there was mutual exclusion, which is ensuring that only one thread does a particular thing at a particular time. Um, one thread excludes the others. And that piece of code that's being excluded from is called a critical section. It's typically something that's, uh, op that's being operated on um, that basically if you have more than one thread in there, you're probably going to get some bad behavior. And so that's why we call it a critical section and why we need mutual exclusion. And the way we did that last time is we talked briefly about locks. Um, only one thread can hold a lock at a time, and it gives you that mutual exclusion. So um, we talked about uh, two uh, atomic operations. Um, we talked about lock acquire and release. Uh, wait until the lock is free and then grab it and then release is unlock and wake up uh, any of the waiters. And uh, again, that was just a brief, quick discussion. We will get there um, in much more detail when we start diving into synchronization in a few lectures. But uh, one thing I did want to briefly uh, do is tell you that there's some other tools that um, we might use instead of just locks. And there's a really rich set of, of uh, synchronization primitives that we'll start talking about. But one of them that I wanted to just mention, since you might encounter it uh, fairly quickly, is uh, semaphores. And the semaphore is basically, uh, it's a generalized lock that was uh, first defined by Dijkstra in the 60s. Uh, and it's been around since then, and everybody uses it inside of uh, various operating systems. And um, it's really kind of like a generalized number, OK? So a semaphore has a non-negative value associated with it. It has two numbers, or two uh, operations, P and V, OK? So P uh, means that the, uh, it's an atomic operation that waits for the semaphore to become positive and then decrements it by 1. Um, some implementations call this the down operation. And then V. Uh, is an atomic operation that increments the semaphore by one. And if somebody's waiting on it, uh, it'll wake one of them up. OK. So um, P, by the way, stands for uh, Proberen, to test in Dutch. And uh, V stands for Verhogen, which is uh, Dijkstra's influence on this. Um, what I wanted to give you was a couple of patterns. So one pattern for a semaphore is uh, very much like a lock. We call it a binary semaphore or a mutex. Um, the initial value of the semaphore is equal to 1. And then uh, if you do a semaphore down, uh, then uh, the first thread that does that decrements the semaphore from 1 to 0, and it gets into the critical section. If any other thread tries to do that, then it immediately gets put to sleep because that would decrement the semaphore uh, below 0, which is not allowed. So all subsequent threads that uh, try the semaphore down are all put to sleep. And then eventually, when you finish the critical section, that first thread calls up, which increments the semaphore from 0 to 1, which immediately wakes up one of the threads that then decrements it again. So this acts exactly like a lock and its uh, um, mutual exclusion pattern using semaphores. Um, and uh, we actually saw 
the lock we use was called a mutex. So that terminology uh, gets intertwined between locks and this particular use of semaphores. Um, another pattern which is kind of interesting with semaphores, which is why they're so interesting, they can have many patterns, is for instance, if we start a semaphore off at zero instead of one, then what happens? Well, if somebody executes semaphore down, um, they're immediately put to sleep, okay? Because they would try to decrement this below zero, um, wouldn't happen, they'd go to sleep. I'm gonna call that thread join for a moment because if another thread then executes se uh, semaphore up, you immediately wake up the one that did down. And so this is like this uh, thread finish join pattern we talked about. And this is yet another use of semaphores. So um, in a couple of lectures, we're gonna go through a number of different synchronization patterns. And uh, you can see that just by setting the initial value of the semaphore to different values, you get some pretty interesting patterns. Okay, so notice, um, by the way, the question in the, um, in the chat here, let me clarify just so we know, uh, the initial value of the semaphore is zero, so that means that uh, semaphore down doesn't actually decrement. It can't because you can never go below zero. So what happens instead is the thread that executes this block of code goes to sleep right away without decrementing. The block that ex executes thread finish increments it to one, which then immediately wakes this uh, guy up and then he decrements it back down to zero again. Okay, all right. Now, these are, these are actually, it's, it's from the Dutch if you actually look at Dijkstra. But um, anyway, uh, all of those languages are related in one way or another. Okay, so if you remember also from last time, um, we talked about, uh, so non-negative uh, value of a semaphore uh, is actually a locking pattern, not necessarily exclusively uh, due to the hardware. So we will talk a lot more about how you implement these things later. So um, if you notice, we're talking about abstractions now. So you don't have to worry how they're implemented. You just have to worry about the API. We'll get to implementing them uh, all in due time. All right. So try to get the pattern and the API, not how it's done. So um, the other thing we talked about, of course, was processes and uh, in some detail, and we notice that there's multiple versions of processes, one which only has a single thread, another which has multiple ones. The key idea is that a process has a protected uh, address space and uh, state, such as open file descriptors, which we'll talk about today, and then one or more threads. And for every thread, each thread has a stack and a thread control block for saving its registers. Okay, and pretty much anything that runs outside of the kernel these days uh, runs in a process of some sort. And the other thing we talked about last time uh, is we talked about how to create processes and that uh, to do that we introduced fork and I'm going to um, briefly say again what fork does because it is uh, the first time you see it it's a little weird. Um, but basically what fork does is it takes an existing process and it absolutely duplicates it, it duplicates it. So there's a new process that is uh, duplicate and um, that new process has an exact copy of all of the, the data in the address space, plus copies of things like file descriptors, and we'll go into that in more depth. Um, the question here about, uh, on, the, uh, on the chat about whether threads um, basically share the heap is, yes, they do. So they share the same heap. They each have their own stack, because if you shared a stack, you wouldn't actually have a, a clean uh, execution of any sort. And so they don't share stacks, but they do share the heap. Um, so now, uh, so this thing about duplicating uh, is a little weird, okay? So the return value from fork is, uh, it's, a, it's a system call, so what you get back is a value. And um, if that value is greater than one, then you happen to know you're running in the parent, and the parent process, that value that came uh, back is the process ID of the child. On the other hand, if you get a zero back, then you know you're the child, okay? And then you have to call uh, get the ID to find out what your process ID is, okay? And uh, if uh, you get less than zero, then everything failed and you didn't actually create a child process, okay? And so just to, to repeat this, and we're gonna see it again later in the lecture, the state of the original process gets duplicated in both the parent and the child, completely duplicated. Okay, the address space, the file descriptors, et cetera. So um, if you looked, for instance, we looked at this brief, brief bit of code here. So uh, here we execute fork. Before we execute fork, there's this one uh, parent process. 
after we execute fork, then um, we now have two processes. And I'm gonna say this again, because it's just weird, right? So those two processes are running at exactly the same spot and have exactly the same state until they return from fork. One of them returns a non-zero number, the other one returns a zero, and that's uh, the point at which they diverge and are no longer exactly equal, okay? So the process that calls fork is always the parent, but it doesn't know that it's the parent. So the way it knows is it gets back a non-zero number, okay? And it's, uh, it's parent process, uh, parent, um, yes, this should say process, uh, but it's also, there's also a thread running there too. But uh, yes, that would be uh, parent process, child process. In fact, here, let's just fix that. Okay, so there we go, we are fixed. Now, um, if you notice uh, the, um, so we'll talk about what happens when you fork uh, in a, inside a multi-threaded process, it's not pretty, okay? So uh, we'll get to that a little bit later in the lecture, but the bottom line is the only the thread that happened to have called fork is the one that survives and all the remaining uh, threads just go poof. Um, their state is around, but there's no thread that's actually running. So if you look at this example we gave, can everybody uh, see the screen again now since I went out and came back? Um, I think we're good, right? Yep, all right. So if you notice here, we call fork. So now there's two processes. The one that got greater than zero, we know is the parent. Um, the one that got zero is the child. So the parent with this kind of an if, else if, else pattern is how we typically write a fork uh, pattern. And so here the parent goes off and says I goes from zero to, to, uh, to nine basically and writes parent and goes parent zero, parent one, parent two. The child goes I from zero uh, to minus nine and basically says child zero, child minus one, child and so on. And the thing we talked about last time is this does not get through, uh, screwed up because does anybody remember why uh, what happens is the parent goes up and the child goes down and they don't prevent each other from doing their task? Anybody remember why? Yep, they all have their own eyes, okay? So this i, this int i, starts out as a global variable that's um, in the parent process, but as soon as we fork, there's now two different i's, one in the parent, one in the child, and so this uh, going up and going down thing don't interfere with each other because they're in completely separate address spaces. So you gotta keep that in mind as well. Um, the only thing that's going to be a little weird here is the, since we're going to be sharing the uh, file descriptors for standard out to the screen, the parent and child statements are going to get interleaved in a non-deterministic fashion. So we won't know how they're interleaved with each other, but we do know that the parent will have 10 values and the child will have 10 values. Okay. All right. And... Um, the, they, uh, the heaps will be separate from the point at which the fork happens. Okay, because the entire address space is copied. So it doesn't really matter whether this is uh, uh, global in the static uh, space or it's on the heap. All right, completely new process. Now, here's a question. Would adding sleep matter here? If I put sleep in there, would it change the outcome? And the answer is no. What it's going to do is um, it might change the interleaving a little bit, but again, it's not going to prevent the, um, the two processes from uh, running to completion. Okay. Are we good? Any questions on that? So the reason it uh, matters whether a parent is uh, a parent versus a child is that um, the parent typically has control over the child in terms of signals, and the parent also can wait for the child, which is my next statement I'll show you here uh, to exit and get its return value from the child. So the child process really is a subordinate of the parent. So um, the other thing we talked about at the very end of the lecture was uh, starting a new program with exec. And notice this, here's the fork pattern. We do our fork. We say if we're the parent, we're going to wait. And I'll talk about this wait for a moment. We're going to wait for the child. Um, but when we go to um, 
the child process, what it does immediately is it does an exec. There's many flavors of exec, so you should uh, do a man uh, on exec to find out. Um, this particular one takes a path and some arguments, and it's now going to take the completely copied uh, address space from the parent, and then it's going to throw out all the copy and uh, start a new program in that address space. Okay. All right. So. Um, so uh, anyway, so this is, seems a little strange. This pattern where the, we fork a new child, which is a copy of the address space, and then we throw out the address space, um, does seem like uh, it's uh, a waste. But in fact, to get the fork semantics, as I briefly mentioned last time, we're actually going to pull tricks with copying the page tables, not copying uh, the data. And so this is not as wasteful as it seems. OK. so. Um, just to look at this uh, idea of starting a new process, here's a typical shell pattern. Let's just look at this in a different way. Again, notice we fork. If we're the pair, uh, if we're uh, PID equals zero, we're the child, so we'll exec the new program. Otherwise, we wait. And uh, if you notice, um, what happens is the result of the fork, the child up here says, oh, I'm the child, I'm going to exec, and the parent goes to wait. And now the parent is waiting for the child to exit. And the child goes off and starts the new program. OK. So um, this is a typical pattern in a shell. Now, I haven't quite showed you how to wait yet. That's my very next slide. But you get the idea that in a shell, when you type a command, it actually forks a separate process for the child. It runs the program. And then later, when that program exits, which, which means the child exits, then the parent will come out of wait, and it goes on to give you the next prompt. OK, now, if those of you who have been typing uh, commands in your version of uh, Pintos, uh, you're typing them at the command prompt. That's the shell. So that's the process that um, lets you type commands and have them run. And that's homework number two. You're going to actually get to design a shell. OK. All right, command line. So bash, TCSH, SH, all of those things are, are shells. Now. Um, so let's uh, look at a couple of other things. So wait, uh, for instance, is waiting for a, a child process to finish. And so here's a very simple example. I just showed you the wait, OK? And so there are many versions of wait. You should also do a man on that one. This particularly simple one takes a pointer to a, an integer, as you see here. And that pointer to that integer uh, will get filled with a return code. And this particular version of wait says doesn't care which um, child process it waits for. It just says wait for the next one. Okay, and in this instance of this program, there is only one. And it'll wait till it finishes. And then when it finishes, we'll actually get back um, the PID in that case of the child, uh, which there's only one, and that just finished, and its status. Well, what does the status come from? Well, the exit code here. So as you all remember, 42 is the meaning of life. So in this case, we exit with 42. Um, and uh, what will happen is that's the child finishing. That'll wake the parent up who's been trying to do a join type operation by waiting. That 42 will get filled into the status uh, variable. We'll get back the PID of that child. And now we'll get to move forward. OK, and of course, that PID is going to be the same um, as the PID from CPID because uh, we only, made, we only uh, created one child in this instance. Now, the last two things I want to show you here, they're related to each other, is how to, how to use the signaling facilities. So this was about how to interact with child processes. And if you have many child processes, then you can actually wait for specific ones, et cetera. OK? And wait works because the kernel keeps track of parent-child relationships. And uh, that's going to be something that you're going to get to have a chance to do some implementing with. And we'll talk about more. Uh, later, okay, and this this uh, we're not passing the this is has nothing to do with which child we're waiting for. We're passing a, a container for it to put the status in, but this particular wait says wait for the next child to finish. Okay. Now, um, and if the child seg faults or something else causes it to fail, that will also uh, wake up the wait because that'll just exit with a with a non-zero code, uh, kind of automatically. Now, um, and uh, if the child calls exec, 
then um, it's still the exit code of the actual child process, not the particular code they're running. Okay, so the wait will wait until the, the, the uh, process finishes, not this particular piece of code, because you're really waiting for the process, not for whatever's running in it. Hopefully that's clear. So um, now let's look at signaling. And so last but not least, if you have two processes and you're interested in signaling uh, from one to another, remember that processes don't share um, processes don't share uh, memory unless we do some work, which we haven't told you how to do yet. And so they have to have some way of communicating. And one way is the signaling facility, which is kind of like uh, a user level interrupt handler. And the way we do that is we have to declare a special structure called a SIG action. And inside that SIG action, we can set some flags and some masks for uh, what's enabled, and you can look that up. But here's a simple thing to do here that uh, the SIG action structure, the handler, we're going to set to this signal callback handler. Okay, and that's this function we've declared here. And, the, and then we use SIG action to set that uh, whenever we see a SIG int signal, call, uh, use this SIG action handler. Okay. And notice that this code is, uh, you know, not particularly great because uh, it goes into an infinite loop, right? While one, do nothing. So this particular code on the face of it looks like it goes into an infinite loop forever, except if you send it a sig int, which, by the way, is what you've got, uh, it's what you got when you do a control C, then that control C will cause that signal to go to this, the callback handler, call the callback handler to be called, and we'll say caught signal, and then we exit at that point. Okay, all right. And uh, there's a question here about whether we need to do struct sig action saw or sig action saw. It depends on whether it's typed after or not. So you should take a look in the actual header file. Okay, now, good question, great question. Is there a default? Um, I'm thinking SIG action isn't necessarily type def, but um, it could be in the version of headers that uh, one has because they change. Um, but this, this, you know, struct SIG action SA would work. Now, the question that was in the um, chat, which is a good one, is uh, what happens if you didn't redirect it? So there's a whole bunch of default actions. So uh, the default action for SIG int is actually what happens when you hit control C is it kills the process. So uh, the default sig int action actually kills the process. What you can do here is if you don't want control C to kill it, but rather to do something else, then you can make your own signal handler, okay? And so there's plenty of default actions. Now there are some handlers that um, in fact don't have any default actions or don't have anything you can set, okay? And so for instance, sig kill is a good example. If you do kill minus nine, uh, and you send that to a signal there's, or to a uh, process, there's no way for it to catch that signal and it will immediately die. But simple things like control C have uh, either default actions or things that you can um, do on your own, okay? And so there's a whole bunch of POSIX signals um, and um, sig int is control C, sig term is uh, the kill shell command, uh, sig STP is control Z, et cetera. And, um, so the things like kill and stop are ones that you can't actually change with SIG action. All right, so we'll get to what POSIX stands for in just a little bit, but it's the standard uh, for, um, for the uh, system calls we're gonna be talk about, talking about, okay? And uh, it is the portable operating system interface for Unix, which is where the X comes from. All right, um, so just uh, to remind you of where we're at, we've been talking about the levels of, operating, oops, levels of the operating system. And the last lecture and this one, we're kind of floating up here in user mode, but you got to remember that there's a bunch of things um, down here uh, in the kernel that are providing functionality for us. And we need to um, talk about how we get from up here to here. This interface is a system call interface and we briefly talked about it last time. You're gonna to get to learn a lot more about it as you uh, design a system call of your own. But um, basically, the things that you're used to at the user level all kind of float in the standard libraries and they're pretty much above the system call interface. So we showed you this last time. This was kind of the, the narrow waist or the, um, of the uh, system call interface, okay? It's kind of like an hourglass or whatever. User code above, system code running below, and then there's the hardware. 
And this system, uh, com, uh, system call interface is basically uh, a set of standardized functions that you can call that go across users kernel uh, interfaces. And we're mostly, again, focusing at the, the OS library and above what you do with that, okay? And I, I pointed out, I think, uh, last time as well, that there's this libc, which is the standard thing that gets linked when you uh, use GCC and you link a program. And that libc has a whole bunch of standardized functions that you typically call, and when you think of C, they're often the, the uh, functions that libc's got, and that those functions end up uh, calling the system calls, which call the OS, which is why many of you have not quite seen system calls yet, but you will. Okay. So at Ministrivia, we are now in full game mode in this class. Um, Project Zero was due today. Um, remember, this is to be done on your own. This is just getting uh, you used to everything about the projects and, and compiling them and so on. Um, I also mentioned briefly that we, we upped the slip days a little bit because uh, of the weirdness of the pandemic and um, maybe because of the weirdness of uh, living on Mars these days, uh, today, which was weird. But um, I'm recommending that you guys bank these for later rather than using them right away. Um, so uh, group assignment should be mostly done. Um, plan on attending uh, your permanent discussion session this Friday, assuming that we've assigned them yet. Um, and uh, remember, these discussion sessions are uh, mandatory, so we're going to um, start taking attendance as soon as people get used to them. Um, and remember to turn your camera on so that your TA can get to know you, because they are going to be your advocate throughout the term, so it's important to get to know them. Uh, the question about when they're going to be out um, is, uh, Soon, I'm not entirely sure the exact timing on that, but it'll definitely be before uh, before you need to attend. Um, and attendance will be taken uh, through the Zoom, um, so just uh, make sure to, to log in. Um, the other thing that uh, we've chosen now is so midterm one is going to be October 1st, as we said on the schedule. Um, it's going to be five to seven, which is um, and it's going to be three weeks from tomorrow, so it's coming up on us. And um, we understand this conflicts with CS170, um, but uh, the 170 staff, staff said basically that uh, you can start the 170 exam uh, after 7 p.m. and they'll give you some details about that um, rather than starting it at six, all right? And uh, our exam is gonna be video proctored. Uh, there's gonna be no curve. This will be a, a non-curved exam so that uh, will reduce a little of the pressure there. Um, and it's video proctored, which will reduce a little uh, additional pressure. And um, also, so you know, you're gonna be using com uh, the computer to answer questions. Uh, so we'll put out more details as we get closer to the exam. We haven't put the bins out yet, but we'll get those uh, for you um, semi soon. Just so you know, um, this is gonna be uh, based on previous terms uh, for the bins, okay? Um, and there are no alternative exam times uh, during our pandemic. So there's one exam. So um, that's, uh, you should uh, talk to, uh, you know, send mail to CS162 and make sure you talk about um, the, uh, you know, talk, do the conflict forms. And the fact that the discussions are on Thursday, we'll take care of that. Okay. All right. Um, the other thing is start planning on how your groups are going to be collaborating. Okay. So get, um, you guys should talk to everybody. Okay. Um, you're going to, uh, we'll talk more about video proctoring, but we're also going to want microphone and, and video and stuff. Um, but, uh, basically start thinking about how you're going to collaborate and plan on meeting multiple times a week. Um, I would suggest with a camera, right, this is kind of the how to humanize things enough that you can actually have interactions. We may even give some, um, we may even give some extra uh, um, credit for uh, pictures of you guys uh, all on Zoom together. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, make sure to fill out the conflict form on Piazza if you have other conflicts. Okay, I think that's been out for a while, so hopefully people know about them. Um, the uh, regular brainstorming meetings, try to meet multiple times a week. I'm going to um, give a part of a lecture that um, I used to give a while ago, and I think I'm going to start giving again on 
uh, strategies for collaborating with teammates. Uh, again, it's very hard to deal with this in uh, today's sort of virtual environment. So we'll see what we can do. Okay. I think that's all the administrivia that I had for today. Unless there are any questions. Okay. Uh, homework one. I don't know. I haven't looked at the schedule. It's on. Everything is on the schedule. So um, uh, whatever. So I think it's wherever it is. So definitely take a look. Um, I don't think it's due quite so soon. All right. Now, let's move on. So there was a question earlier, what does pthreads uh, stand, or what does POSIX stand for? So POSIX is the Portable Operating System Interface for Unix. Uh, and um, just to, to, there's a chat right now about deadlines. We will make sure that every deadline you need to worry about is on that schedule, okay? So we'll try to keep that as up-to-date as possible. So just look at the schedule. All right, I'm glad. Um, we cleared up that. I was pretty sure homework one wasn't due tomorrow. So anyway, so POSIX is the portable operating system interface for Unix, and it's loosely based on uh, versions of the system calls uh, that were appearing in different var variants of Unix. You should know there are many variants of Unix, okay? Starting with the early AT&T days, and then there was Berkeley Standard Distribution Unix. Yay, Berkeley! And a bunch of other ones, including uh, the one you're working with, Pintos. And so um, just among the Unix variants, there were variations. And then, um, you know, and then there were other operating systems that didn't have the Unix versions of the, uh, of the system calls. And so there was a standardization effort to come up with a set of standard system calls that operating systems could support even if they had their own unique ones. And so in fact, if you actually go to look at the, the Windows system calls uh, interfaces, there's actually a partial version of POSIX for some of the uh, system calls. So you can take a look. Um, the, uh, and what P thread is the POSIX threads, okay? And so that was what P thread stood for. So um, let's now talk about this uh, Unix or POSIX idea that's kind of the, the linchpin of this lecture, which is that everything is a file, okay? So, this was actually a little bit of, um, of a strange idea when it first came out, and now pretty much everybody's used to it. But there's an identical interface for files, for devices like terminals and printers, for um, networking sockets, for inter-process communication like pipes, et cetera. Um, all use the same interface with the kernel, okay? And what is that interface? Well, that interface has open, read, write, close. Those are very standard. Um, Variants and the question of is Linux a version of Unix? Uh, yes. Um, so open, read, write, close are uh, standard calls, and you use those on everything from files on disk to devices, etc. Okay. And there is an additional call. Uh, there's an additional call ioctl for um, those things that don't quite fit in the standardized open, read, write, close. So some people call it iocuddle. I've always heard ioctl. Um, it's really IO control, so I call it an ioctl. Um, but there are a lot of ioctl calls that you can make once you've opened a device to configure it. So it might be things like what's the resolution of a screen, what's the, uh, you know, are you blocking or non blocking, et cetera. Those are all typically ioctls. Okay. And so when you make a new device, and you're developing your device driver interface with the kernel, you typically have an ioctl interface for those specialized things that um, don't quite fit into that. Uh, you know, there's square pegs in a round hole as far as open, read, write, and close. Now sockets, uh, the question about sockets uh, and uh, operations on that, we'll actually start talking a bit about sockets next time as well. So this idea that everything's a file was a bit radical when it was proposed. Um, there's a kind of a seminal paper from Dennis Ritchie and Kim Thompson that described this idea um, back from 1974. And uh, I actually usually teach this paper when I teach 262 um, because it's an interesting first paper for that class. But since I'm not teaching it this term, I'm teaching you guys instead. I figured I'd pop it up there as an optional reading. So if you go to the resources page, you can actually take a look at that paper and see how they talk about this idea 
and how they talk about things that um, still are well used ideas in uh, Unix operating systems to this day, and that's from 1974. So it's pretty impressive how some of their very clean interfaces and ideas have lasted so long. It's kind of a, it's a little bit weird from a um, research paper standpoint. If you've done any reading of research papers, we'll read some more normal ones um, later in the term. This one doesn't really have a lot of evaluation, but it does describe some ideas. So um, give it a shot. So the file system abstraction, which is what goes across devices and files and sockets, et cetera, uh, is pretty much the simple idea that it's a named collection of information in this file system. Um, POSIX file data is a sequence of bytes. As you can imagine, the input from a keyboard is a sequence of bytes. Uh, the input from a disk is kind of a sequence of bytes. It's really um, blocks that then get put into the kernel and then uh, eked out to the user as a sequence of bytes. Um, for files themselves, there's actually metadata, which is information about that file, such as how big it is, the, what was the last modification time, who's the owner, what's the security info, what's the access control on it, et cetera. Um, does it have a set UID bit um, or a set GID bit on it? We'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. Not today. Um, and then, a, so a file is like a bag of bits, okay? A directory is, as you well know, a hierarchical structure for naming bags of bits, okay? And if you notice, um, as you're all very well aware, a folder is uh, something that contains files and directories. And uh, what you're gonna learn as you get inside the kernel is a folder is really just a file that happens to map names to, uh, to actual file contents, okay? And if you look, um, the uh, hierarchical naming is really a path through a, a graph, okay? So you start at the root directory, which is a file that contains root uh, names, like slash home means that the root directory slash has a home entry in it, which points to a different file, which has uh, an FF entry in it, which points to a file that has CS162, et cetera. And opening a file is a, a path through all of these different directories. And uh, you can imagine we're going to want to talk about caching and stuff to make that fast. But we don't need to worry about that later. And then there's a bunch of other interesting things about lengths and volumes and things that we can talk about as we get more in detail. But we're trying to, trying to keep things uh, a little more at the user level for the moment. So and then tying this all together, of course, every process uh, graph or tree, that's a good question. Depends on what you're talking about. Um, the directory uh, infrastructure you see described in the original Unix is, uh, strictly speaking, a tree. Um, we've got the ability to make something much more graph-like uh, with modern operating systems, and especially when you get soft links, it gets much more like a, a graph, OK? Um, so, uh, soft links or sim links, as it was mentioned in the, in the chat there, they're the same thing. So, um, so every process actually has a current working directory. It can be um, uh, set with a system call, which you could look up. You could do man on chadir, change directory, and it takes a path and it changes uh, the current working directory of that process. Okay, so that uh, on the face of it is nothing more than just uh, a path that looks you know, like here's, this is a path here, home, FF, CS, 162, public HTML, so on. But that path is associated uniquely with that particular process that called change directory. Um, and then it can be used. Now, we can still use absolute paths like home, uh, OSCE, CS, 162. This is an example of a path that's absolute because it starts with a, a slash at the very beginning of the path and therefore ignores the current working directory. But all these other things you're used to, you know, index.html or dot slash index or dot dot slash index or tilde slash index, these things are all uh, relative to the current working directory. Okay, and so that's why you might set that current working directory. And then you can use file names that look like this. So if you say in, you know, index.html, what happens there is it takes the current working directory and then appends to it uh, slash and then index.html, and that's the real file we're talking about. So that's why you don't need to have an absolute path for everything you use. Okay. 
And dot dot is a standard notion for the parent of a directory. So if you use dot dot slash index, it would actually take the current working directory, uh, go to the up a level and then down to index.html. Okay. And tilde is actually um, a form of absolute. So that's a um, it's thing, it's it's under my relative, so this is uh, a little misleading, it's not relative to the current working directory. It's under my notion of relative here uh, because everything is relative to whatever your home directory has to be. So that's that's a good catch. I'll fix that. Okay. Um, so tilde slash index, it says my working directory slash index, tilde CS162 means the working directory of the CS162 account. All right, so those are two different usages of tilde. Okay, so the focus of today's lecture, so did, did everybody catch that? So there, this tilde slash and tilde name slash, those are two different usages for different users, okay? The, either the U user, whoever you are, or the CS162 user. Okay, now, so we're gonna be working our way through a lot of different things through here, okay? Um, it's, by the way, uh, the uh, tilde is actually a function of your shell. It's not necessarily a function of the operating system. So if you think it's too much of a hack, then you could use a different shell that doesn't have it, for instance. Um, so today we're gonna kind of work our way through uh, parts of this upper level here, okay? So for instance, uh, we'll talk about the high level IO with streams, and then we'll get into file descriptors and the system calls. And we'll go a little bit below the system call um, interface, okay? But we're not gonna get too far down there because we're trying to keep ourselves in the mode of um, you know, user level here. Okay, so quickly, high level file IO or streams. So a stream is really an unformatted sequence of bytes. Could be text or binary data. Um, Unix is notorious for um, having no, being agnostic as to what the format of files are. That was actually also a really big um, innovation at the time that that Unix paper came out. And you can take a look. Um, but uh, if, you, if you notice, that means that an unformatted secret sequence of bytes with a pointer, that's a stream. And so here are some um, operations. Uh, oftentimes you wanna include standard io.h, stdio.h. But for instance, f open uh, is an example of a high level uh, streaming interface. Most of them have an F in front of them, not all of them, okay? Um, excuse me, and F close. And notice that F open, which opens a stream, returns a pointer to a file structure, okay? And over here we have a mode, and that mode is actually a string which tells you about how you wanna open that file. So you can do things like, uh, open it for reading or writing or appending or um, et cetera, okay? Um, and some of these options allow you to truncate a file to zero and, and so on, okay? So there's nothing in it if you open it, uh, et cetera. So an open stream, if we succeeded because the file existed and we have permission, then what comes back here is this file star. So F open returns a pointer to a file data structure. And that file data structure is what we're gonna use from that point on to, to read and write and interact with that data, okay? If we had an error, we would actually get back a null or a zero from this. So we'd get back a no file star. And so ideally, you would actually check to see whether what came back from fopen is null or not. Uh, and that would indicate an error, and then you'd have to go take a look at uh, an error structure to find out why. So, um, standard io.h is the, is the file you want to include, okay? Here, um, include standard io.h, uh, has all of the, the things that you're gonna need to be uh, interacting with io. So if you try to use some of the things I'm talking about in a lecture and it tells you it doesn't know uh, some of the constants I'm using, it's probably because you've forgotten to include that .h file and you're gonna to wanna to get used to figuring out what .h files you need to include because that's gonna be a, um, an important part of figuring out how to get your compiles to work. Okay, so uh, let's try to keep the chat down a little, chatter down a little bit so that we're not distracting people uh, in the lecture here so they can ask questions. Um, 
there are some uh, special streams, okay, STDIN, STDI out, and STD error, which um, are defined for you. Okay, so standard in is a normal source of input like the keyboard. Standard out is the normal source of output like the screen. And standard error is the place where errors go. And usually standard out and standard error both go to the same place, which is to your screen. Okay, but these are all defined without you opening them. So when your process first starts up, you have a standard in, standard out, standard error. And by the way, um, when we, well, you'll also have the, uh, the low level IO versions of these as well. Okay. Um, so standard in, standard out basically give you composition in Unix. Okay, the reason file is capitalized is because uh, it's, um, it's a structure um, and they've chosen to capitalize a lot of the names of, of important structures. Uh, the other answer of why the file is capitalized is, I guess, because it is. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so uh, the question about what happens if you open a file but don't close it and then exit uh, the process, um, typically what happens is it uh, flushes everything out for you and then uh, closes in the kernel. So it's not possible for you to, to uh, cause a major problem by opening something and then killing off the process without closing it. It gets cleaned up automatically. Um, so standard in and standard out, you're going to see when you start working with your shells, uh, in, especially in uh, homework two, um, are basically going to allow communication between processes. Because if you have a whole chain of processes and you manage to connect standard out of one to standard into the next, then you can communicate between those different processes in a, a chain. And that will be one of the patterns that you're going to get very used to as you get more comfortable with Unix. Okay, so this is an example here. The cat command says just take a, a file and send its output to the console. So if you were to say cat hello.txt, you would just see, uh, and you had a hello.txt file, you'd see the whole file just streaming on your screen. On the other hand, when you put a pipe symbol, like this little vertical bar, and you pipe it to grep, then what happens is cat takes the file, sends it to standard out, but by putting this little bar, I've redirected standard out to be equal to standard in of the grep command. And so now grep will take the input uh, that we got from hello text and will grep for the word world. And it will only output to the screen or its standard out things that actually have the word world exclamation point in them. Okay. So this composition with bars, which you will implement uh, on your own in homework two is really a connecting of standard in and standard out. Okay, good. Now, um, let's look a little bit more at some of the high level API. So uh, for instance, there are character oriented versions. So notice that all of these commands have a file star pointer into them. So we have to have opened the file first and then we pass in the pointer we got back to something like f put c or f put s or f get c or f get s, we put that file handle in there. Um, and as a result, the file structure, then we can put characters, that's a type of writing, a single character at a time, or a string at a time, or get characters. OK? So example, here's a, a simple example where I open uh, the file input.txt. Notice that this is a relative reference. So the current working directory is going to matter here. Um, and I'm opening that input.txt for reading. I'm opening output.txt for writing. What comes back from fopen is uh, the input file uh, structure pointer. What comes out from this fopen is the output file structure. Okay. And we also have an integer, which we're going to use for getting characters. So we, we uh, do an fgetc on input. That gives us the first character. Um, or end of file eof if there's no character there. Okay. Now, can anybody tell me if, if we know that characters, um, let's talk, talk about ASCII characters for a moment, um, are eight bits, why did I use an int for C? Can anybody think of that? Okay, EOF is something that is uh, not eight bits, right? Because it's minus one, which is really, um, in representation, it's really um, uh, all ones in C. So it's 32 ones is a minus one. And so we can basically check 
for uh, end of file by looking at that character. Otherwise, we can use it as its uh, character representation of eight bits. Okay, good. And so then notice we check and see is the character EOF. If it's not, we put it on the output with F put C, um, and then we continue uh, F get C for the next and so on. Okay. Yep, exactly like a 61C project. So hopefully this is reminding you guys what this is like. Now um, let's look briefly at the block oriented version. So those were character oriented, block oriented, um, are F read and F write. Um, and here um, we again, we're opening the same files, but now we have a buffer, okay? And so um, the, uh, now F get, uh, so now what we're gonna do is F read, is going to be grabbing a buffer pointer from us. So we're gonna put the buffer here and we're gonna say how big the buffer is. And we're gonna say uh, what the size of the, the uh, items in the buffer. So notice this buffer is char uh, characters and it's a buffer size in size, okay? And if you notice, um, so then what we're saying here is our buffer can take buffer size characters. That's what those two things are. And here's our input, uh, file descriptor or file, excuse me, input file structure pointer. And we'll F read will read uh, data into the buffer. Now, how much, uh, can anybody tell me how many characters that this F read command will read from the file? Anybody have any idea? Um, how many uh, how many characters this F, F read will grab? Okay, so everybody's looking at uh, buffer size of 1024 and they're all saying 1024. However, what happens if the input file only has 20 characters in it? This F read, how much will it return? So it's gonna return 20, right? Cause we're gonna get 20 characters. So this will read the whole file in that instance. So just because you give it a buffer that has uh, 1,024 characters worth of space doesn't mean you'll get 1,024. Okay, so the F read is gonna give you, tell you how many it got. Then we're gonna say, while we're getting uh, some characters that are greater than zero, uh, which why would we get zero? Well, if, they, if we're at the end of file, because we've read all the characters, we're gonna get zero back. So this says, well, we got some characters, let's write those characters out. So notice the pattern here for write is, here's the buffer, this is its length in characters, and we're gonna out, that's our output uh, file, and that will write the characters we just read, then we'll read the next grouping, and we'll keep looping until we're done, and then we'll close. So this really just copies input.txt to output.txt, okay? Now, and uh, moving, okay, so if there are only 20 characters in the file, of course, we'll run, we'll read one grouping, we'll write it out, and then we'll get zero this time, and we won't even go through the while loop a second time. Okay. Now, you have to take a look at the, uh, do, a, do a man page on the, on the commands to see the exact or, um, organization. Okay, so we have a question here about why we get 20. So the reason we get 20 is if the file only had 20 in it. If the file had, uh, uh, you know, 1,025 characters, what would happen is we'd get 1,024 in this first read. Length is definitely bigger than zero. In that case, we would write 1,024 characters out. We'd grab the second read would only get one character, even though it could get 1,024. We'll go through the loop one more time. We'll write that one character out. The next read will get zero characters. Then we'll close the two of them. Okay. All good. Now, uh, system programmers, that's you guys. Um, so the question also, will this block? Depends a lot on what you're reading from. If you're reading from a file, uh, if you're reading from a file, it's, uh, there won't be necessarily any blocking there. It'll just read till the end of the file, um, okay? If you're reading from a, um, a standard in like a keyboard, 
an end of file comes when uh, special characters are, are um, typed, like control D sometimes is end of file. Okay, and so no, it doesn't have to be 1024 either. And these could be something other than characters. They could be integers, in which case you would uh, you'd say size of int, and this thing would uh, pull the things in in quanta of uh, four bytes at a time. Okay, characters um, <laughs> depends on whether we're talking about uh, Unicode or not as to how many bits. For now, since we're not that's not an issue we want to deal with. Like we're going to say that characters ASCII characters are eight bits for now. Okay. Um, you guys will get to learn more about that later. Okay. So you as system programmers, that's what you are now, need to be paranoid, which means you want to uh, always check for errors. So for instance, we ought to always write code like this. I mean, you guys ought to always write code like this. F open input.txt. If input is null, you got to uh, deal with the fact that there was a failure. Okay, always check for null. Always check whatever the return code is. Make sure you check it. This case, the return, the fact that there is an error is returned as a null, and then you have to do something else like call p error or whatever to find what error it is. This will actually uh, say fail to uh, open input file and then tell you what the error was. Um, every one of the commands has a way of, of giving you an error back if there's a possibility of an error. So be paranoid, okay? Check return values. It's very easy to be bad as a system programmer and not check your return values, and then you're gonna get code that behaves very badly at the worst possible time. Okay, there's a Murphy's Law for um, bad code. Okay, and uh, it, <laughs> yes, so a language with result, such as Rust, I'm assuming that you're talking about, which is totally an awesome language, we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that later in the term, would give you a better way to check, but we're talking about C here right now. Okay, and PR knows the interface uh, to interact with, which is the Erno interface. It knows how to look for where the error is. Okay, all right. I may be a little loose with error checking. Don't take what uh, my looseness with error checking is anything more than trying to make sure the code examples on the screen don't get ridiculously long. Okay, so this is literally do as I say, not as I show you in class when it comes to error checking. All right. All right. So. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about positioning uh, the pointer with your inside of a file. So there's fseek, which lets you basically set where that pointer is so the next read comes from it. So what I've been talking about transparently uh, without really saying a lot about it is I said, well, maybe this f read reads the first 1024, and then when we do it again, we start at that 1024 point for the next read. Why is that? Well, because there's an internal pointer, okay? There's an internal pointer that's in, um, in the uh, buffering system that's gonna keep track of where you are. And so you need a way potentially to change that position. And so fseek lets you change uh, where you're gonna read from next. And ftel tells you where you're reading from next. That tells you where the pointer is. And uh, rewind goes back to the beginning. Okay, so, and um, notice that this uh, seek command actually has a whence uh, argument to it, which basically can be one of these three constants, seek set, seek end, or seek cur, which basically tells you that when you say go to a given offset, what happens? Well, if you seek current, it takes the current position and adds an offset to it. Uh, if you say seek set, it basically just takes your offset and sets the pointer to that absolute value. And then if you say seek end, it actually takes from the end back. Okay, and you can look this up but it's preserving this high level of abstraction of a stream. Um, now let's contrast what we've been talking about uh, with low level IO, okay? So kernel Unix, uh, the Unix CEs, which have POSIX IO, have sort of the following design concepts behind them, okay? Um, there, the question here about whether you need whence, there are different forms other than fseek that actually don't need whence. You can just do a man on, on fseek, you can see them, okay? So um, some concepts that went into this, which I've already hinted at, is uniformity, that everything's a file. We already talked about that. Open before using, clearly we've talked about that, but uh, for instance, that gives a, an opportunity for the kernel to check for access control and arbitration and not return an open file handle that you can use unless uh, you have permission to use it. Everything's byte-oriented, 
okay, which is um, even if the blocks are transferred, everything is in bytes. So this is the fact that the kernel is completely agnostic on the uh, structure and format of any files or data in the system. It has no, um, no requirements except for one particular type of item, and that's the directory. So the directory has a special format that the operating system, excuse me, can know how to uh, interpret. Okay, the kernel is gonna buffer reads and writes internally. Part of the reason for that is for caching and performance. We'll talk about that. But another reason for that has to do with the fact that things like disks are blocks oriented, so you can only pull in a block at a time, whereas, again, this is a byte oriented interface to the user. And so we need to have buffering inside reads and writes to uh, give us both performance and the ability to, to match uh, the block structure of the devices against the, the um, bytes of the user. Okay, and then explicit close. So let's look at this raw interface. So notice there's no F in front of open here, no F in front of create or close. There are some flags that sort of say um, what access modes you want and what permission bits, okay? And what comes back from open is not a file star, it's an integer, okay? It's a file descriptor, it's just a number. And uh, if the return value is less than one, that's an error, and then you have to look at the error narrow variable to know what the error was. Okay, all right. Um, we'll, we'll, Mutex's, uh, there is no explicit locking of the form that um, is being asked about for Mutex's in there. You can take a look at that philosophy in the Unix paper. Um, we'll talk about locking a lot more as we get further. Um, so, what, so when you get back from an open, you get a number, which is a file descriptor. This is a, open is essentially um, isomorphic to a system call. In fact, what's inside of open in the libc library is a little bit of wrapper around a call system call, okay? And so the operations on the file descriptor um, are as follows. When you do open and it succeeds, you actually get an open file description entry in a system-wide table in the kernel, okay? And the open file description object in the kernel is an instance of an open file and the question I might ask you is, so why did we return an, a, um, a number that's really a pointer uh, or is really an index inside a table that points at file descriptors rather than a pointer to the file descriptor? Can anybody figure this out? Yes, yeah, security. What sort of security? Anybody guess? Yeah, so there's lots of good, good answers in the chat there. So one, uh, this description uh, entry is in the kernel, so the user couldn't access it if they wanted. More interesting, there's a philosophy here, which is by returning only a number and only allowing you to access a number in the commands, it means that um, there's no way for you to uh, access things you're not supposed to because the kernel immediately checks your number about uh, against the internal table, and if uh, it doesn't match up, it just doesn't let you go and do anything. There is a little bit of a of information leakage advantage to that as well, but this is mostly about the security of not being able to address file descriptions you're not supposed to. So if you look at some of, uh, if we look at the parallel to the ones we talked about before, there are um, standard in, standard out, and standard error, which are the uh, system call descriptors equivalent and their number, their values are zero, one, and two, okay? And they're in this uh, UNI STD.H, okay? And then there's a way to say, well, for a file star, give me the file number inside of it. And that's because when you did, if you did F open, you actually are running a library call that internally calls open. And so every file star you've got actually has a file descriptor saved inside of a user level data structure. And you can go back the other way as well. So the low level file API, we have things like read instead of F read. So real, read takes the file descriptor integer, a buffer, and uh, the maximum size of that buffer in bytes in this case, it doesn't quite have the flexibility of uh, F, uh, read, and it'll tell you how many came back, okay? And uh, if you get zero bytes, you get an end of file, and if you get minus one byte, you have an error. Uh, writing is similar, and seeking is uh, kind of the equivalent of fseek we talked about earlier. Okay. So here's a simple example where we do open. Here's the name of the um, of the file, 
We have uh, the following flags for the fact that we want to be read only um, and uh, various uh, um, permissions that we want to have on that file. Okay, and we open it, we get uh, a file descriptor back. We read from it. Okay, we close it. Notice that read and close have to use that same file descriptor. Okay, and then write, we might uh, open or we might try to write something to that file descriptor. Okay, but if you notice when we've closed the file descriptor, by the time we get around to writing it, uh, it's already closed. So that could be an error, right? Um, there's lots of er errors that can come back. Um, the file being bigger than max size is not going to come back as an open error. That's going to come back when we try to write on it, of course. Okay, so how many bytes does this program read? Well, we look at what came back from RD, and that tells us how much we read. So design patterns, again, just to tell you this, this is actually at the system call interface. Always open before you use. It's byte-oriented, and you have to close it when you're done. Okay. Reads are buffered inside the kernel. Writes are buffered inside the kernel for lots of reasons we talked about. This buffering is all part of a global buffer management, which we'll also talk about when we get to the internals. Um, and uh, you'll see why the demands of things like the file system and the buffer manager and so on require that caching, but also that it can give us good performance as a result. So some other operations in low-level I.O. We talked about ioctals. OK, this is an example of uh, when you open something that's uh, not a file in the file system, but rather is a device or whatever, you might call some ioctals on it. You can also call, um, you can also use ioctal on open files for certain uh, issues about blocking and non-blocking and so on. Um, we can duplicate descriptors. OK, I'm going to show you that um, where you have an old descriptor um, and you get a new one out of it, okay? And we can also make pipes where we, we create a brand new pipe, which is two file descriptors, uh, two integers in an array. And then if you do fork, um, then you have uh, two ends of a pipe that the two processes can use to communicate with each other. And that pipe command is exactly what you're gonna use uh, to set up pipes when you do your shell. And there are ways to do file locking, but it's not a mutex per se. It's, a, it's locking that's specific to the actual file systems. Okay. And ways of memory mapping files. So that'll be another interesting thing that we'll talk about once we get a little bit uh, further along in how uh, things like page tables work. We'll talk about, in fact, how to take a file and map it directly into memory so that now you can do reads and writes to memory instead of reads and writes to the file system. So you'll be actually uh, looking at, at memory uh, and structures and so on in memory rather than executing read or f read and write or f write uh, calls. Okay. And we'll talk about asynchronous IO a little bit later as well. So, why do we have uh, high level file IO? Well, high level file IO, first of all, to look at it, we have something like f read. What happens when you execute f read? is there's a bunch of work being done just like a normal function in the library. And some of that work is about checking to see if the thing that they're trying to read might already be buffered in a local uh, user level buffer. Okay, and if not, then it goes ahead and does this pattern we talked about uh, last time or the time before and how to actually do a system call where you have to set up some special registers uh, with a system call ID and um, the arguments, et cetera, and then you do a special trap that goes into the kernel and does the system call and comes out, okay? All right, low level is an example in which, uh, where the read really just does the system call. So read is essentially just a C-level wrapper for the system call. F-read is something more sophisticated. Now, there was a question in the chat about what I mean by buffering. What I mean is you may do read, uh, you may read 13 bytes at a time, but the underlying system is maybe optimized for 4K bytes at a time. What fread will do is it'll actually ask the kernel for 4K bytes and then put it into a local memory data structure. And then all the subsequent freads you do for a while, just look in that buffer and grab the next 13 bytes without having to go into the kernel much faster. Okay, because kernel crossings actually take some time. Okay, 
And so streams, as I mentioned, are buffered in memory. And so one of the ways you can see this, for instance, is if you do printf beginning of line, so printf actually goes to the buffered version of standard out. Um, and you do a sleep and you say end of line, what happens is when that finally gets flushed to the console, possibly because of that control or that uh, new line there, everything gets printed at once. It says beginning of a line and end of line as a single item. Whereas with the low level uh, direct system call, you might do write to standard out file, uh, file number. So the standard out beginning of line, you wait a little bit and then you do the same thing with end of line. And what you'll see is the word beginning of line on your console, you'll wait 10 seconds, end of line. So there's no buffering in this path at the bottom, but there is buffering in the, up, in the path up top, okay? So um, yes, so now you're starting to say some interesting uh, questions here, okay? So um, the 18 and 16 have to do with the number of characters we're writing there, by the way. Um, so uh, the question you might ask is, uh, is there buffering, the question that was asked, is there buffering in the kernel if there's buffering at user level? Yes, there's two different buffers going on, okay? The buffering in the kernel is completely transparent to you. There's no way for you other than timing uh, and failure of your system to really know that buffering's going on in the kernel. Buffering in user level can make things much faster, but you can do things in a way that uh, mixes things up quite a bit uh, if you're not aware that you're using, for instance, uh, the, the stream version of a file um, and the uh, raw version of the file together, and that's usually uh, a problem, okay? So what's in a file star? Well, as we mentioned, a file star has user level buffering. So inside of it, it's gotta do the raw calls. And so it's clearly gonna have a file uh, descriptor inside of the structure file star. That structure is gonna be in your program. Okay, and so when you do f open, what happens is f open allocates a new file structure, then calls the raw open, and then returns and, and some buffering inside the file, and then returns the pointer to that structure from its library to you. Okay. So buffering inside of a file is done at user level. So when you call f write, it's put into the file's buffer until you flush. Uh, the C standard library may choose when to flush out to the kernel. Um, if you really care that something is visible in the file system, then you're going to need to do F flush on your own. Okay, and so you want to make sure that you're not expecting things that you just wrote with F open. Uh, you do F open, F write, and you're doing something else. You don't necessarily know that that's gone to the file system unless you do flush, F flush. Okay, so weakest possible assumptions about whether things got from user level into the kernel or not. So here's an example where we do f open of file.txt, we write something, okay, to uh, we write a b to that file, okay, and then we do uh, f open file.txt again. So notice we have two copies of the file open in two different uh, file star structures. And so if we go to read, from the second one, we're not necessarily going to see the first one. Okay, so this F right here may or may not have gotten into the kernel depending on whether it got flushed or not. Okay, all right, because we've opened this file twice, two different bufferings in the kernel. We've written to one and we haven't flushed in two different uh, bufferings in the user level. We haven't flushed it out, so we don't really know what's gonna happen. So if you're gonna write code like this, be aware. So notice what I changed here is I wrote the data, then I did an F flush. At that point, all the data that's buffered gets put into the kernel and now this F open and read will get the data, okay? So just be aware that when buffering's going on um, and you start doing weird communications, you gotta be careful. Okay, and if you close the first file, then yes, it'll get flushed out. Okay. So your code should behave correctly regardless of what's going on. So make minimum calls to F flush. And uh, with the low level API, you don't have this problem. So if you only do open uh, reads and writes, you're not gonna have the, the problem of different users of the file not seeing the data because the kernel hides all of its buffering from the users. Okay, but uh, you don't get the performance advantage of all the buffering in user level. 
And why do you want a buffer in user level? I just wanted to show you system calls are 25 per, uh, times more expensive than a, user, uh, than a uh, regular function call. So if you look uh, here, the blue is time for regular user uh, just function calls. The green is system calls for doing get PID in this case. And the red, again, is a version of get PID that doesn't have to do a system call. OK. And so um, notice that it's much better not to make system calls if you can avoid them. OK. So if you read or write a file byte by byte, the max throughput, for instance, might be 10 megabytes per second. Whereas if you do f get c, which is a buffered single byte by at a time, you could actually keep up with the speed of your SSD. Why is that? Well, f get c is a buffered command. And so you're giving it a file star. And what happens is the first character you read goes into the kernel, brings a big block of data into user level. And then the subsequent f get c's just quickly return you another character until you use up that buffer. And then you make another system call. This is exactly a form of caching. OK, exactly. And uh, that's part of the reason that you can run into trouble if you use it uh, incorrectly. So system call operations, uh, why, why buffer in user space now? So um, in addition to performance, uh, we want to keep the kernel interface really clean. Okay, so the operating system doesn't know anything about formatting. Okay, um, for instance, there's no way to read until new line from the kernel because again, the kernel doesn't know what a new line is. That's a that's a feature. Okay, so what the solution is is you use the buffered calls like f get s or get line that take file stars. And what they do is they read a chunk of data out of the kernel, and then they just very quickly walk through until they find the next new line and give it uh, give the whole line to you. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about process state. Okay. Um, if you notice here, we're kind of moving our way down to the bottom uh, a little bit, but um, the kernel on a successful call to open has a uh, file descriptor returned to the user. And an open file descriptor is created in the kernel. Okay, and so for each process, the kernel maintains a mapping from file descriptor to open file descriptor uh, description in the kernel. And then on all the future calls, the kernel looks up uh, the file descriptor it gets to find uh, the actual um, description structure. Okay, so here, if we notice, we have two buffers. We open. Um, foo.txt, and then we read here, we read from that file descriptor into buffer one, 100 characters. Why does this work? Well, the kernel remembers, because you opened it, that FD, the, the number, is talking about the file foo.txt. That's all cached. Okay? And therefore, just calling read uh, knows what file to work with. And furthermore, it also knows to pick up where it left off. So this read gives you 100 characters. This read gives you the next 100 characters. And why? Because that's stored in this file description in the kernel. OK. So what's in the file description? Well, you could look it up, right? You guys have uh, Pintos. You can check it out. The things that are important for today here are um, the inode structure, which is an internal file system thing we'll get to soon enough tells us about where all the blocks are on the disk for your file. And the offset tells you kind of where you are in the stream. OK. So what's the abstract representation of a process? So if you guys bear with me a little bit, there's a couple other things I wanted to say before we're done. Um, so remember, a process has got threads, registers, et cetera. Um, it's got uh, memory for the address space. And then in kernel space, We've got this file descriptor table, which maps um, numbers that are file descriptors to actual descriptions of files. So if we, we execute open foo.txt and it gives us back descriptor 3, this is what happens. We have descriptor 3 in your process points to an open file descriptor table, description table, in the kernel that says the file is foo.txt and it's at position 0. Okay, And not shown as. Uh, Descriptor 0, 1, and 2. So I started at 3. And uh, hopefully, we'll get to 0, 1, and 2 here in just a second. Um, but now, suppose that after we open the file, we say read descriptor 3, which is this file, uh, into the buffer the next 100 characters. Well, what happened? 
was we read the next 100 characters into that buffer and we're at position 100. And notice the kernel uh, knows what position that file description's at. It's at position 100. Okay. Finally, if we close, what happens there is the file descriptor table is cleared and the file description is cleared and voila, we've just finished that off. Okay. But let's do something more interesting. So let's not close, let's fork. Okay, so here's process one. Here's a child process we just created. Notice that we have the address space uh, is duplicated. We've got uh, the thread control block. I'm assuming there's only one thread for a moment. And the file descriptor table is duplicated. So now both process, the parent and the child, point to the same file description. So that means that um, either of them can, um, can read from that file. Okay, so if this process tries to read uh, 100 bytes from uh, file descriptor three, then it's gonna read 100 bytes and will now be at position two. And now this guy does the same thing and voila, we're at position 300 because we have uh, forked the process and they're sharing the file descriptor. All right, it's copied. So now we start to see what it is that fork is doing that's more than just the address space. Okay, and if this process one closes the file, notice that all that that does is it only removes the file descriptor pointer to the file description because that pointer or that file description is still in use by another process. So there's a, a reference count on there and the fact that process one closed it does means that process two still has access to it. Okay. Um, so if we wanna, uh, if you, you're asking, can we copy this open file description for process two. If you fork process two, you'll get a copy of it again. Okay. The only way to get a new file description that's unrelated to the old one, if that was your question, is by doing another open of the same uh, file. Okay. So why do we allow this? Well, aliasing the open file description is a good idea for sharing resources like files between parents and children processes if they're working on the same thing together. Okay. And remember, in POSIX, everything's a file. So this really means that both the parent and the child is uh, both have um, access to the same resources. The question was, why is this 300 and not 200? If you notice, at the point at which the read happened, we went to 200. Notice that the, uh, this process goes to read another 100 bytes from file descriptor three. If we look up three, we see that, yes, indeed, here's the file description. The pointer is at 200, and so when we read the next 300, uh, next 100 bytes, we've just advanced it to 300. Okay. So, um, so when you fork a process, the parent and child's printfs go to the same terminal. So this is one of the last ideas I want to finish up. But let's take a look, and this is going to be very important for homework two. So uh, hold on for a second here. There are a set of three standard file descriptors that are always allocated. We already talked about them. Zero is for standard out, one is for standard in, and two is for standard error. So um, zero is all the inputs from keyboards, one is the standard output that ha has no errors, and two is the output for errors. So if a process that happens to be, say, a shell, forks another process, which might be a child process, it gets copies of all the same file descriptors. This is why if we have a parent that forks a child and the two of them are both printing output, notice that descriptor zero is shared and so the outputs go to the same terminal interleave, okay? And that's the standard way that um, a command that you type at the, the, the command prompt for a shell works, which is why when you type a command and it's printing, it goes to the same terminal that your shell was running from. So, and if we close uh, standard out in process one, we don't close it in process two. Same with standard in, okay? The only thing that will change standard out or standard in is if you change them, okay? Which is, uh, the question here is if you have two processes both on standard in, uh, wouldn't they uh, duplicate the, the input? And the answer is no, it's whichever one reads uh, first gets the next character and vice versa. Okay, there's only one copy of things coming in. 
So other examples are sharing network connections after fork, sharing access to pipes. These are all things that when we start getting into more interesting patterns are gonna be there, okay? The, the final thing I wanted to show you here is about dupe and dupe two, which is, uh, for instance, suppose we've got uh, file descriptor three pointing at this description, and now we, uh, we execute a dupe of three. So what dupe of three is gonna do is it's gonna make a new file descriptor four, okay, which points at the, open the same open file description that three was. And so after dupe, now we have both three and four pointing to the same file. And we could, if we wanted, close three and still use four. Okay. Dupe two uh, allows us to do something a little different, which is basically allows us to take file descriptor three and duplicate it and call it file descriptor 162. And so now we've chosen which file descriptor we wanted to use, whereas dupe chooses us a one, okay? And when you start getting into the shell with homework two, rearranging what descriptors zero, one, and two do is how you will make uh, pipes from one command piping to the next and so on. If you remember cat uh, piping, into, um, piping into grep, okay? All right, and I think we've run out of time. There are some fun uh, things. I, I guess we did have enough questions. I wanted to just give you this one which is a fork in a multi-threaded process. Everybody's asked me about this. Don't do it uh, unless you really know what you're doing and, and aren't gonna be surprised. So here's an example of a process that not only has some file descriptors, but it's got multiple threads, a red one and a black one. If you fork and suppose it's the black thread is the one that runs the fork command, then when you're done, You've got duplicates of all the file descriptors and address spaces, but only thread one still running. So this is unlikely to do what you want unless you're really doing what you expect, okay? All of the memory that the threads had will still be around, but the threads themselves won't be running, okay? If on the other hand, you exec, that's exactly right. That was a good question. Then you throw everything out and you get a brand new process and that's probably will do what you expect, okay? Okay, it's safe if you call exec. Um, the other question about does dupe always assign the next int? Um, I wouldn't count on that. If you had anything that depends on that, I wouldn't count on it. It basically gives you one. It's probably the next one, but you never know for sure. Okay, and what does exec do? Exec erases all of the processes address space and loads it up with the new process. Okay, all right, I think we're, we're over time. So I'm just gonna say in conclusion, we've been talking about uh, user level access to, to the file I.O. and some of the user interfaces that you're going to become really familiar with, okay? And the POSIX idea of everything's a file uh, is a pretty interesting one. I encourage you to take a look at that original Unix paper. All sorts of I.O.s managed by open, read, write, close, uh, an amazing amount. Um, and we also added some new elements to the process control block, like mapping from file descriptor to open file descriptions, the current working directory, et cetera. So I want to wish you all a, a great uh, weekend and we'll see you on Monday. I'm sorry for going a little bit over. Have a, uh, have a great weekend, everybody.